Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Stephen Kurtzon. I'm a retired pastor living in Fond du Lac, uh, having served most of my congregations in the state of Minnesota. I hope you won't hold that against me. <laughs> we begin our worship with hymn 224, and our order of service today is the service of word and sacrament found on page 26. But I am truly sorry. 
started for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, Lord. Lord mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Sunday after Pentecost is written for us in the Old Testament book of Amos chapter 6 verses 1 through 7. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalne and look at it. Go from there to great Hamath. And then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are you better than those kingdoms? Was their land larger than yours? You put off the, you put
put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fat calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. This is the word of the Lord. We sing in unison Psalm 146 on page 120 in the front of our hymn.
please stand. Our gospel for today also serves as our sermon text from Luke chapter 16, beginning with the 19th verse. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. And you may be seated for our next hymn.
Grace to you, mercy and peace from God our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we mentioned earlier, the basis of our sermon meditation this morning is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 16, beginning with the 19th verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, does it really make any difference? Does it really make any difference if a person is a Christian or not? Does it really matter if someone believes Jesus is God and our Savior from sin, death, and hell? These are questions a lot of people are asking in our day and age because so many feel that everyone is going to a better place after they die and that there is no hell. They base such opinions simply on their feelings and on their emotions. But according to God's Word, the Bible, it does make a difference if a person is a Christian or not. And by using that word Christian, we're referring to those who trust in Jesus as their Redeemer and Good Shepherd. It makes a difference, yes, already in this life, but more importantly, it makes an eternal difference for the life to come. This has taught us especially in the difference between the rich man and Lazarus in life, in death, and in eternity. Our text for this morning from Luke chapter 16 is one of our Lord's parables. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In this story that Jesus told, there are several contrasts. The first contrast is that one man was extremely rich and the other was terribly poor. The rich man enjoyed the best this world had to offer. He wore expensive clothes. Every day he ate the best food and drank the finest drinks with his friends. If this rich man lived today, in the year 2022, some might refer to him as part of the 1%. His lifestyle would probably rival that of Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame or Bill Gates of Microsoft fame, or even Sir Richard Branson. And then there was Lazarus. Lazarus was sick, and he couldn't even walk. His friends would lay him in front of the rich man's door where he would beg for food. Back in those days, there was no such thing as garbage service. People would take all of their waste and simply throw it out into the street where the dogs would quickly gobble it all. We can just imagine the rich man's servant coming to the door and throwing out all the leftovers. We can also picture Lazarus begging for some of those scraps while the dogs licked the sores that covered his body. What a contrast between these two men. But the main difference between them the most important difference was that of faith and unbelief. The rich man is nameless. It's as if Jesus looked into his book of life and the Lord didn't find his name recorded there. But the poor man was named Lazarus. Now it's notable, this is the only person in any of our Lord's parables who was given a name. So we need to pay attention. This is significant. The name Lazarus means, God is my helper. This tells us that our Good Shepherd knows and calls each of us by name. How important this is for you and me to remember, especially when we feel all alone and we think no one cares and, and we believe that no one wants to help us with our problems and our challenges. But Jesus sees, and he knows, Jesus hears. Jesus answers in the way and the time that he knows best. He is our helper. 
Now, from what we're told in this parable, all the rich man was concerned about was the earthly goods of his physical life. All he was worried about was the here and now. He could care less about the hereafter. But by the name Jesus gave him, we know this terribly poor man Lazarus trusted in God for his help. By the name Jesus gave him, we know that Lazarus placed his confidence in the promises of our Savior found in the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament at this, at this time had not been written yet. The ancient Jews called their Old Testament Bible Moses and the prophets. We'll hear more about that later. Sadly and unfortunately, there are many in our own day and age who are just like this rich man. All they're concerned about are the things of this life and how they can get more and more and more and more. They could care less about the life to come and where they will spend eternity. There's a good possibility they don't even believe in a life after death. And so their philosophy is found in the ancient expression, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Maybe you know people like that. Maybe there have been times in your life when you have thought like that. And when budgets are tight, and when inflation is nearing 10%, those of us who lived back in the 1970s, we, we remember what that was all about. And when medical bills or other expenses are piling up, money may be all you have on your mind too. You don't have enough of it, and you need more of it. And so it may be tempting for us to make money and wealth the most important things in our lives too. But we also need to remember that being rich is not necessarily sinful. Wealth can be a tremendous gift of God. We think of believing Abraham and Solomon in the Old Testament. They were both wealthy. And one of the reasons God blesses some of his children with wealth is so they can help those in need and support the work of spreading the gospel to those around us and throughout the world. But as we know, wealth also has its dangers. In fact, the Apostle Paul warned us. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Second, we view the difference between the rich man Lazarus and death. We read in our text, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Death happens when a person's soul leaves their body. The body remains here in this world to return to the dust from where it originally came. But the soul enters the life to come whether that is in heaven or in hell. And on the last day, when our Savior returns in all of his glory, our bodies and our souls will be reunited and we will rise from our graves to stand before Christ. Our text says nothing about a funeral for Lazarus. His earthly remains were probably thrown into a, a pauper's grave somewhere. We are told the rich man also died and was buried. The word buried here in the original Greek of our text actually means entombed. We think of the tomb of the wealthy Joseph of Arimathea where Jesus' body lay prior to his resurrection. We can all probably imagine in our mind's eye this rich man's lavish funeral, the expensive burial clothes, 
all of the beautiful flowers, all the food, all of the prominent community people who were present. In its own small way, it probably looked like Queen Elizabeth's funeral this past Monday, with all the pomp and circumstance. But in spite of his wealth, and in spite of the lavishness of his funeral, the rich man, he opened his eyes in hell. Look again at the contrast with Lazarus. The angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now in our older English versions, this phrase was translated Abraham's bosom. During his earthly ministry, Jesus also portrayed heaven as a great feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This term, Abraham's bosom, or Abraham's side, was a beautiful Old Testament expression for heaven. Abraham is also considered the spiritual father of all believers in Christ, whether they lived in the days of the Old Testament or whether they have lived in the New Testament age in which we now find ourselves. So this figurative expression, that Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side simply means that Lazarus was a true believer and that heaven was his home. We also need to understand here at this point that the rich man did not find himself in hell because of his wealth, nor did Lazarus find himself in heaven because he was poor. There will be plenty of poor people in hell as well as many rich people in heaven. Faith in Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world is the determining factor because such spirit-created faith grabs hold of Christ's righteousness. That righteousness covers our sin and guilt so that we can stand before God as his loved and blessed children. As our Lord said in the last chapter of Mark, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now in, in writing about this section of Jesus' parable and the rich man's lavish funeral, one biblical commentator had this to say, and I quote, As for me, let God's angels stand around my deathbed and carry my soul like the beggars into Abraham's bosom, and let my poor dead body be laid humbly away. May this also be our prayer too. And finally, we have seen the difference between the rich man and Lazarus in life and in death and now in eternity. Lazarus was in heaven. The rich man found himself in hell. Lazarus enjoyed eternal bliss. The rich man suffered everlasting torment. In hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. There are many today, including those who consider themselves Christian leaders and teachers who deny the existence of heaven. I've heard with my own ears a Lutheran pastor of another synod who said such a thing right from his church's pulpit. I've also personally heard it said by people, how could a God of love ever send anyone to hell? Well, the Son of God himself tells us in today's parable the truth about the bliss of heaven and the horribleness of hell. And let's remember that if we deny hell, then we also deny heaven because God's word speaks of both as real places. Hell is so awful because it consists of the total separation from God for all eternity. Hell is so awful because unbelievers suffer not only for the sinfulness they were born with, but also for the sins that they committed during their lifetimes. They suffer for those sins 
because they have turned their backs in unbelief on the forgiveness that our Lord Jesus has earned for everyone. Our Lord then relates to us the conversation between the rich man and Helen, Father Abraham. Although we read this for our gospel lesson, I want to read it again to you. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. In these words, we witness that the unbelief of earth continues in hell. The rich man wanted water not forgiveness. And although he was in no position to do so, he argued with Abraham. After he expressed his concern for his five brothers, Abraham told him that they have God's word they could listen to. That's what he meant with that phrase, Moses and the prophets. But God's word wasn't enough for this rich man even as he was suffering in hell. Nothing at all had changed. His unbelief still thought that it knew best. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. So Abraham got right to the point so there could be no misunderstanding. They have the Holy Scriptures, and if they do not listen to God's word, then they won't listen to anyone or anything else either. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Moses and the prophets, in other words, the Old Testament scriptures, are filled with promises of our Savior who would earn the forgiveness of sins for the entire world. He would do this by standing in our stead before God and living the perfect life that our Maker requires and demands of us. He lived that perfect life while He was upon this earth and it was credited to you and me. And because of our sins, we deserve God's punishment. Not just now, but forever. But Jesus, again, he stood in our place and suffered the very pains of hell on the cross that you and I deserved. His death is also credited to us through faith. Jesus would then rise from the dead to prove that his life as well as his sacrifice were acceptable to his heavenly Father in our behalf. As we consider this morning the difference between the rich man and Lazarus in life and in death and in eternity, may we all, every one of us here today, realize what is truly most important in life. It's not to accumulate the most money we possibly can, but we are to nourish and strengthen the faith the Holy Spirit has given to us by partaking freely and deeply and fully of the green pastures 
and still waters of God's Word. Through that Word, we are brought to faith and we are kept in that faith in our Savior who has washed away our sins in His eyes and who has covered us before Him in His beautiful robes of righteousness. Like the poor man in Christ's parable, the Lord is our helper and someday you and I will also lie in safety and in peace in Abraham's bosom. In Jesus' name, amen. And please stand. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 31 in the front of our hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Pour out your spirit on us that we may grow richly in divine knowledge and spiritual understanding. Bless the proclamation of your word everywhere so that hearts may be turned from the darkness of spiritual ignorance, falsehood, and despair to the light of knowledge, truth, and life. Be with our missionaries in our own and distant lands. Protect them, encourage them, Crown their labors with success. Let your word shine in our homes, that parents and children may dwell together in love and serve one another in kindness and humility. Watch over the sick, the sorrowing, the anxious, and the weary. Preserve those who are in any danger of body or soul. Supply us by the grace of Jesus with the Spirit's power so that we may ever be comforted by your truth and sustained by your love. For these and all the other things you know we need, we confidently ask in the name of him who gave himself for us that we might live through him, Jesus our Lord. Amen. And we also pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. We continue with our communion liturgy on page 33 in the front of our hymnal. The Lord be with you.
congregation may be seated and our communicants may come forward at the direction of the ushers. Come, the Lord's table is now ready.
Once again, good morning. It was a, a pleasure to serve you with God's Word and Sacrament this morning. All of your announcements are printed for you in the bulletin. And may you all have a safe journey home. Thank you.